How's it going? My name is Austin Gill, and this video is going to cover edge-based authentication by using edge compute to verify JSON web tokens. We'll be discussing the virtues of combining stateless authentication tools with edge compute in order to make your applications easier to scale horizontally, uh, reduce some of the workload that gets on your origin server, and potentially reduce the latency for some of your users. Before we get too far into that though, I do want to mention that there is a link in the description that will get new users $100 in free credit to try out some of our cloud computing products. With that out of the way, let's get started. So first and foremost, if you don't know what a JSON web token is, you can go to jwt.io and get a lot more information. Or I'm sure there's also a very handy video on the subject somewhere on the internet. JWTs are pretty cool because they allow you to create little packets of information that can be cryptographically proven to be untampered with, meaning you can put some data in it, give it to someone, and then when they give it back to you, you can be sure that the data that they give you hasn't been altered or fussed with. This is particularly useful in authentication workflows because it allows a user to log into your system. You can create a JSON web token with their information, send it back to them in the response, uh, and then it can be stored for future use. So when they need to make an authenticated request, they can send that JSON web token along with the request via cookies or headers. And then when you verify it on the back end, you can ensure that the client hasn't changed some information to access another user's content. Another benefit is that they're stateless, meaning they don't need to reach out to some central authentication service to verify them. They can be kind of self-contained. Now, this means that you can scale your application horizontally more easily because every little JWT can be verified on its own. Uh, and it also means you have fewer database lookups so you can have the request response cycle be faster. And finally, uh, because you don't have a central service, you don't have one point of potential point of failure or for slow bottlenecks. Now, the other piece of the puzzle is the edge or edge compute more specifically. And there's already a lot of information out there on the internet, so I won't go into too much detail. But the big benefit here is with an edge compute runtime, it allows you to run client requests through an edge node, which is part of a globally distributed CDN. And you can modify requests from the client on their way to the origin or modify responses from the origin on their way to the client. Now, depending on the use case, Edge Compute can offer a lot of different benefits, including reducing the amount of latency that users experience in their response times, moving some work off of an origin server and onto the edge, and potentially integrating dynamic compute with the static cached content that is already stored in the CDN. So let's look at a more practical example using an architecture diagram that shows three clients making requests to a server running in the Akamai cloud. The first client is going to make an authenticated request, but they're going to leave out the authorization header. Therefore, it, the request is going to be blocked at the origin server. The second client might make an authenticated request with the authorization header, but they might be including an authorization token that is invalid or expired. So that request will also make its way all the way to the origin server, and the origin server will have to check that invalid token and once again, reject the request. The third client makes a valid authorized request, goes to the server, gets verified, and the response gets returned. Now, all of these clients experience some sort of authorization workflow that has to happen for the application to function. But with each of those verification process, the server is being asked to do more work. So let's look at another example. In this example, we have the same clients that are making the same request, but all of the requests are passing through the Akamai Edge first. So client number one with the missing authorization header is going to go to edge worker one and it's going to be rejected right away. And client number two is going to have a authorization header but an invalid authorization token. And once again, it's going to be rejected by the edge worker. Client number three is going to successfully send an authorized request which gets verified by the edge worker and go ahead and gets passed along to the origin server which means the origin server has less work to do. And it's also worth noting that because these three requests are being handled by the Akamai edge workers, these are all different edge workers that are going to treat these clients and they're going to be handled by the closest edge worker to that user based on their geographical location. Why is that relevant? You could find yourself in this scenario where clients one, two, and three live in different regions, but client three and four are in the same region. So their requests will actually be processed by the same edge worker. 
And because they're both authorized, their request will both get to the origin server. Now, if the origin response is to send something that isn't personalized for each user, but can actually be shared across any authorized user, let's say something like a specific file download, the first time a user successfully makes that response, it's going to go to the origin and bring it back to the edge. But the second time a user makes that response from that edge node, that file could actually be cached and stored so that any authorized user will just get an immediate response. Now it's also worth noting that the length of these arrows are designed to sort of represent the distance that the request may have to travel because we're talking about an a CDN or an edge node, these are going to be as close to the to the user's geographical location as possible, whereas the origin server could be any sort of distance away. Now, it's also worth mentioning that this example uses Akamai edge workers, uh, but these concepts should still apply to pretty much any edge compute runtime that you run into. But because I'm specifically focusing on Akamai edge workers today, it means I can actually get a working demo and walk through the code to show you today. If I go to my Akamai Control Center and open the demo property that I'm working with, I can scroll down to the rules and find the custom edge worker JWT demo rule, which is configured to run the demo JWT verification edge worker anytime the path matches edge auth demo. And this property is configured to run at akamai.austingill.com. Next, I can navigate to that demo JWT verification edge worker, and I can explore the, the code bundle. So I'll see that there's two JavaScript files in here. One is this jwt.js file, uh, which actually you can find in the tech docs. It's one of the external modules that actually lives in GitHub and is maintained by the Akamai team. Now, the main.js file is where the actual edge worker logic exists. It imports a couple of modules, sets up the JWT validator, and exports an on-client request function. Inside of that function, we grab a secret key uh, from the variables on the property and the authorization header from the request. Now, this public key is going to be one of the variables that exists in the property and is assigned this PM user underscore JWT RSA pub key and the value is going to be the public key for a public private key pair. Now, where did this value come from? I actually grabbed it just from uh, jwt.io. If you use the RS256 uh, algorithm, then you it will generate a public and private key for you. Now, generally speaking, you shouldn't grab these private and public keys for the, but for the sake of this demo, this is going to work fine for me. So if we look back at the code, we can see that uh, we grab the secret key from our variables, we grab the authorization header from the uh, request headers, and if either of those don't exist, we are going to go ahead and terminate the request early with either a 500 or a 400 status code. If those values do exist, then we can go ahead and get to the actual logic of this edge worker. We can set up our import key, which we'll use with the JWT verifier. We can grab the actual JWT value from the authorization header. We will validate that JWT using our public key. And then whatever happens after you can decide on. In this case, I'm just logging it to the logger and setting the value in a cookie. If we want to test this out, we can actually head to akamai.austingill.com slash edge auth demo. And if I just hit enter, we can see that as expected, we're going to get this early termination where it tells us the authorization header is missing. Now the browser on its own doesn't have a way of adding authorization headers, but fortunately there's this browser extension called mod headers where I can add an authorization header. So if I say, ah, uh, oops, authorization header, and let's just leave the value empty for now. And if I refresh, we'll see that we get a different error message. It saw the authorization header, the public key was pulled from the property, but when it tried to validate the JWT, it's saying it's malformed. Now for a normal application, you'd probably want to modify this error message, for, but for the sake of this demo, we can see that an unauthorized request is not actually successfully making its way through to the origin server. Now, what I can do is in this case, I'm going to go ahead and go back to jwt.io. Normally you would use some sort of library for this, but because uh, it's all ready for me, I'm going to set up my payload of information. I'm going to copy this JSON web token, and I'm going to paste it into my authorization header value. And now if I refresh, we should see a different behavior. So pretty sweet. As expected, the page is going to redirect to just austingill.com slash whatever the route was. And we're going to see this cute little page that I made just for this demo. So if I want, I can rerun that auth. It's going to check the uh, 
header, the authorization header, as long as it's still there. And if I go ahead and uh, remove this, I can see that I'm going to get that same error message as I did before. And if I remove that, uh, I can see once again, the authorization header is missing. So only the authenticated request is actually successfully getting through that edge worker. So what are the benefits to all of this work that we've been doing? Well, for unauthenticated requests, we are reducing the response times because they're happening at the closest edge node to the user. We are adding some logic to terminate those requests early as well. And this is reducing the surface area that bots or bad actors could potentially use to access our origin server. And because we're reducing so many of these unauthenticated requests from even getting to the origin, it could reduce the amount of processing power needed on the origin server, which could potentially speed up the origin server or maybe reduce the costs of your origin server. Now, those are the benefits for unauthenticated requests. For authenticated users, it's a little bit of a different story depending on your application. For a lot of systems, if you're just making dynamic authorized requests for each individual user, it's kind of the same because the request will go to the edge node, to the origin, back to the edge, back to the user, which isn't much different than just going straight to the origin and back to the user. But there are scenarios where we can see some benefits even for authorized requests. First, just by using JWTs, we have a stateless authorization service, which means we don't have to reach out to a centralized authorization service that could potentially add more wait time to the request response lifecycle. Now, this is a benefit just of using JWT or stateless authorization, not specifically something related to using the edge. However, as we saw with the last architecture diagram, we can see that if the origin server is going to return some private or authorized information that is static and can be shared across every single user, then you can take advantage of the CDN cache in such a way that multiple users living within the same geographical region can download uh, an authorized request from the CDN's cache instead of having to wait to pull it all the way from an origin server. And this gets particularly interesting if you want to introduce the dynamic nature of edge compute, because in theory, you could have something like an origin server that returns a static cached version of H an HTML page, and then you can use the dynamic nature of an edge compute runtime to actually inject personalized data into that static HTML. And you can pull the data either from the JWT payload or from uh, a key value store like Edge KV. Now, this is a pretty complex workflow, but it's really cool and very powerful if you're looking for the most performance without necessarily sacrificing dynamic compute. And if you have any more questions on it, feel free to reach out to me somewhere online. I'd be happy to discuss with you further. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go today. And if you made it this far, I can only assume that you found this video helpful or educational or entertaining. And if that's the case, I'd really appreciate if you gave it a like. And if you want more videos like this in the future, be sure to subscribe. Also, before I go, just in case you missed it, I'll remind you that there is a link in the description that will get $100 in free credits towards cloud computing products for new customers. There's really no reason not to take advantage of this, and I hope you do. And if you do, please come back, leave a comment on this video, and let me know what you build because I would love to see it and discuss further. Okay, catch you next time.